welcome YouTube. The video you're about to see is a reaction video. It is a video of opinion. Nothing personal is meant toward the individuals in the videos. My volition uh, for posting these reaction videos is to look at these videos and critique them through the lens of correct sentence structure, communication, parse, syntax, grammar. Usually they are quantum grammar related videos and I'm looking for correct sentence structure knowledge here. And I'm also looking at the claims made in the videos through the lens of correct sentence structure, communication, parse, syntax, grammar. Now you may notice that I'm doing certain things with my hands. I am not making any secret hand signs or gestures. When one is doing public speaking, there's only so many things you can do with your hands. You can fold them, maybe put them on your hips, dangling lifelessly at your sides, put them in your pockets, hold them like this, whatever it is. I'm not making any type of signaling gestures, unless I do this, which means shaka. Keep in mind the information, the things that I'm sharing in this video are for educational purposes only, entertainment purposes only, nothing personal towards the individuals in the videos themselves. Thanks and enjoy. Welcome to another Coral Blade Grotto broadcast, another reaction video. I haven't done one in a while, so I figured I'd reach back into the vault and do a classic. One of Colin David Ife and Wynn Colin Miller's uh, earlier videos. My Christmas gift to you. Uh, another, actually, another Christmas gift to you, the viewer. And uh, this, let's first, let's take a look at, uh, see if we can pin down a time frame. So this was published 11 years ago. And let's look at some of the comments here. Uh, would be interesting to learn this stuff. Unfortunately, my short attention span won't allow it. Hey, at least they're being honest, right? Confession, I'm a double-boarded physician. I am a <laughs> double-boarded physician and former faculty at Stanford University, and I have no idea what I just heard. Okay, first of all, what does this have to do with uh, this individual having no idea what they just heard. Um, if something is foreign to you, it doesn't matter what university you go to, and I highly doubt that uh, Stanford University teaches plain English fiction babble grammar mechanics like IMA. I've never heard of a word IMA. You gazi. It's pretty funny. Uh, it says, words became math, and then every 70 years something happens in Lost Masters, and hen sign a stamp in your, <laughs> the postmaster, when do I learn the basics about this, feel like I walked into PhD level lecture and I need a one or one intro to this, one on one interest in this stuff, man, do I feel stupid right now, I can't really tell if they're making fun of this, being sarcastic, sarcastic or being serious, uh, and this was three years ago. Let's see some of the responses. There's no 101 course in BSing. This is all make believe word salad that's meant to confuse people into thinking there's something big secret. And only these con men have the answers. That's pretty funny. Uh, it's not a big secret. Uh, it's right out in the open on the public on this YouTube channel with almost... 500 videos so uh, if either one of those individuals want to study it they can start here the basics are here the 101 is here uh, the USA has been blinded since the mid 1800s I don't know if the USA uh, maybe the USA should get some corrective lenses I guess I don't know uh, why does quantum language consist of English words, although those English words still derive from German, French, and Latin? For example, David Miller claims the affix pre means no. 
but actually it's Latin for before. Where do I look for equalization of prequels? No. Well, Bowles Getzi, or I'm sorry, I don't want to butcher your last name. Well, Bowles, the reason why PRE means no is because it negates the now space. Anything that negates right now, the continuum, the now space, it means no. So that is what I'm guessing David means when he says pre means no. Uh, why does quantum grammar consist of English? Although those English, why does it, that's like asking, why does a tree have bark? Uh, why is the sky blue? Why can you sit in a chair? I mean, in any case, let's get to it. Couldn't really find a, getting too caught up in, in what was going on, having too much fun down there. So we'll say this was published about 11 years ago, and it makes sense that the video was probably recorded twice that long ago, although I'm not sure. Here we go. Get your brains in gear. Enjoy the day. And look after yourself. Have some water. You may end up with a headache. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Thank you, David. By the way, Stephen is my lead out here when I'm not here. He can syntax and write as good as I can. And the seminar doesn't stop when you leave here. You guys all know how to operate computers. You get home, you can Skype me, you can uh, send me emails, ask me anything you want for as long as you study this stuff. I mean, I've got students that have been with me 15 years. And no, obviously. Um so he's in Australia. Obviously, people paid a fee for freight to go to this seminar, right? And he's offering a continuing education, a knowledge cultivation right there. He's offering that where you can go on the Internet and you can Skype him and, and email him. And I've sort of based uh, my channel on that model in a sense in that my email is public. You can see it right down here. And if you want to learn this, uh, you can email me and apply for a workshop. We go through three stages in life. Your first stage is you do not know what you do not know. No one was aware of syntax until you saw this program. Once you saw it, you were aware of what you did not know, which you didn't, means you didn't know about the math interface on language. For, for that fact, for 8,500 years, the entire population of the planet Earth in 5,000 languages did not know about the math interface on syntax until 1988 when I broke. How could he possibly know that that uh, figure, that time span? How could he possibly know that they didn't know that? I'm sure he could say, reasonably guess, that people didn't know it during his lifespan up until he brought it to the public in 88, but how could he possibly know you know, that figure, that puzzles me. The code. And then when you know what you know, you become a teacher and stand up here like I do and educate people. And Stephen is in that location now where he can stand up here for 20 hours and put on a 20-hour seminar also. 20 hours. And then there's a lot of things that he, he knows. I've done, uh, here and there, I've done a smattering of webinars uh, for groups of people that I didn't know, I would come on as a guest and, and speak for about an hour, hour and a half. I've actually put together, just roughly pieced together seminars that could last two to three hours, but 20 hours. That's a lot of talking. Those the right things to say, but he hasn't had the 74,000 hours of knowing what the wrong things are to avoid. And it's like, uh, You've got 100 landmines on the floor here, and you've got to go from that wall to that wall. How many of them do you get to step on before you get to that wall? In other words, how many mistakes do you get to make? Zero, right. So, like he said, I got 73,000 hours of mistakes from, from walking around, stepping on landmines, and going through the hardships of life, but I got 1,000 hours of how to do it right. I think he's being uh, humble there or perhaps undervaluing himself. Um, he's got way more than a thousand hours of, of doing the correct thing or the right thing or however you want to say it. And to transpose that over to what I do, 
I've been teaching this for about, I've been teaching correct sentence structure for five years, and I can definitely say the more I do it, the better I get at it. So that's why this has been my most successful year yet with students, uh, getting them to get the closure on the grammar that they need to, in order to do the things that they need to do. Um, I have quite a large number of individuals who are very high level with their syntaxing and their creation of correct sentence structure. Whereas when I started back in 2018, I could count on one hand the individuals that I knew and could certify knew how to syntax correctly and I would still have fingers left over. That is no longer the case. And through process of elimination, like Sherlock Holmes says, when you remove all the things that cannot be, regardless how ridiculous the end result is, that is the fact. And so the, the math is syntax now creates the facts on a mathematical level where when you write a sentence frontwards, it says the same thing when you write it backwards. And we're going we're to start off using the, the math interface to show you how this works and how we broke the code. This one here is... Uh, if you take your math problem, 2 plus 3 equals 5, and you want to check it, well, it's 5 minus 3 equals 2. If you want to multiply, 2 times 3 equals 6, and 6 divided by 3 equals 2. Now, this all came about... Um, Real quick, what he just said there. The way this applies the correct sentence structure is you're looking at the 2 plus 3 equals 5. Uh, 5 minus 3 equals 2. The way that applies the correct sentence structure is the positionals would uh, perform the function of the, the signage of the plus and the minus in the order of operations. The way in the one side, on the, on the left side, you have the plus sign, and on the right side, you have the minus sign, where you use the positionals and correct sentence structure. Uh, you would have, like, four, and then on the other side, you would have by, or you would have of, and then on the other side, you would have with. That's how that works. Spiral notebooks. Remember, some of you got something with the red line down the side here? Well, the way this code got broke was on April 6th in 1988. Now, for three years, I worked out math problems and nothing seemed to work. Now, one morning, I got up half asleep and I wrote 1 plus 2 equals 3, 3 minus 2 equals 1. On the red line, went and got my coffee, some toast, came back and I said, and I, but when I sat down, it was, it was faced this way and I'm going, oh, that's a graft. So I grafted it. And when I grafted it, I broke the code. So, deductive reasoning says that a fact, whether it's frontwards or backwards, is still a fact. Like in a math problem, if we have a 2 here and we've got a 2 here, nothing's changed. 5 here, 5 here, 6, 6, those are whole objects, therefore they become the facts. We gave those the Fs. Then the one thing that appears in front of a fact was an equal sign in a math problem. In a math problem, the equal sign has no value, does not modify anything. So if it can't modify, and and or are the conjunctions. So we gave that a C. Then you've got, when you took, uh, when you went to school and you studied math, you had the negative, the positive, the negative, the positive, when you did grafting. So any motion from one side to the other resulted in in motion. Well, here you've got a plus 3 and a negative 3, so therefore you're going from one side to the other. Same thing in multiplying and dividing. Because the motion constituted the verb. So we, we factored out this, the operation and we gave this a verb. Because the verb does not modify the condition of a fact. It's like this pen here. It's in motion, but it's still a fact. So and this, the only verb that exists, you have two verbs, is a singular, are is plural, and the verb is thinking. But thinking is a condition of state as a fact. Therefore, the thinking condition of state when in motion is the only word that it both maintains two conditions, a verb and a fact, at the same time. 
Now, I'm sure that there are going to be a few eyebrows being raised by what I'm about to say next. And what I'm about to say is this. I don't agree with what David is saying here. I honor the man. I respect the man. I've got love for the man. He was very kind to me. I was in communication with him, direct communication with him during the last year of his life. Via phone calls, Skype, emails, text messages, so on and so forth. I'm saying right here that I don't agree with what he just said simply because of the golden rule of this grammar technology. One and one is one. Rule one, rule equal. Therefore, nothing in there, nothing in the grammar can maintain two conditions of state. One word, one meaning, one function, one congruency. A positional is a positional. A lodial is a lodial. A fact is a fact. A verb is a verb. A conjunction is a conjunction. One and one is one. He's just saying that the verb maintains two conditions of state. Now, I suppose some people could make the case that, oh, there's an exception to every rule, and that this is the exception. Well, okay. I can honor that too. I'm simply pointing out the discrepancy here. One discrepancy of many discrepancies that one will find if they go over these old videos after they've achieved correct closure on the grammar. This is in no way, shape, or form passing judgment on that man who, again, I have much honor, respect, and much love for and am very grateful to. This is not a reflection or a judgment on that man. What I'm saying is I'm talking about what's coming out of his mouth with regards to the grammar, which is what I focus on. It's my ballywick. It's what I do. It's what I've been doing every single day for five years. I know that's not much in comparison to 75,000 hours or whatever he just said. But what I can say is I'm 100% sure and confident of what I'm saying when I talk about this grammar. If there's one thing in life that I know about, it is this. And I'll take the Pepsi challenge with anyone out there who wants to step up to the geometric level playing field with me and talk about this. Email address is right there. So let's continue on and listen to what David has to say. Because everything that happens in, uh, in the world is a result of something thinking before it can actually happen. Running is not a verb. Jumping is not a verb. That's a condition of your thinking. Those are conditions of state as an end result called order of operations. So the only thing that was left was plus and minus, multiply and divide. And those we assign to the prepositions. The positionals. Because when you write the sentence. As I said at the beginning. For the bridge is over the river, and for the river, is under the bridge. The over and the under are opposite prepositions. Both pictures are identical. Ladies and gentlemen, that is not correct. I'm sure the other eyebrows is going to get raised right now. I can't read what he said, what he wrote on there, but the gist of it is, for the bridge is over the water, for the water is under the bridge, and to illustrate the function of the positionals and how they flip positions, that's why he's saying this. But when you get right down to it, when you get literal with it and specific with it, what he just said is not correct. Because if you say the sentence, for the bridge is over the water, 
for the bridge is over the water, that's not even a correct sentence structure because you need two position lodial fact phrases in front of the verb to begin with. And you need at least two after the verb, at least two after the verb. Normally you would have three. He has one before the verb and one after the verb. That's the first point. Second point, over and under are not correct positionals. There are four positionals, four of, with, by, period, end of story, in order for the mathematical interface to function correctly. That's point number two. Point number three, literally, when you read the sentence, for the bridge is over the water, if you were to literally go backwards under the auspices and rules of correct sentence structure, for the bridge is over the water, it would be under the water is by the bridge. And it's not even correct going forwards, but I'm just saying that going backwards, it's even less correct. Or it's even more wrong, <laughs> if you could say such a thing. But he's just using this as a tool to teach people, I think, you know, this is my best guess, how the positionals function in order to maintain the integrity of the facts forwards and backwards. But literally what he's saying is not correct. And I've done a whole video on this. Now we can take, we can take, and I've been doing this for uh, almost 15 years now. People come to me with Bible passages because every once in, everyone wants to know who God is or wants to know what the Bible really says. One third of all the words are missing from the Bible. One third of all the words are missing from the Bible. Well, if we're going by correct sentence structure standards, I would have to say about two thirds of the words are missing then. If, it, if, you're, if David is talking about writing it in correct sentence structure, uh, but you know, for a, word, a sentence that I use in my workshops, um, like, uh, I like to swim and snorkel. That sentence, I like to swim and snorkel. How many words is that? I like to swim and snorkel. That's six words. So how would you translate that into correct sentence structure? That would be, for the claimant's knowledge of the facts, is with the claim of the joy, with the swim and with the snorkel by the claimant's hyphen performance, period. That's a lot more words than those six words originally. So I would say two-thirds of the words are missing. And the Quran, and Buddhism, and Hinduism, and all the great religions in the world. One-third of all the words are missing. And so you can take the whatever is written and then go out and put the correct prepositional phrases in, in now time. Remove the negative because you can't perform negative. Remove the illusion and create a fact. Now, a lawyer would write this like that. The bridge is over the river. And you were all taught when you were in fifth grade in school, never start a sentence with a prepositional phrase and never end a sentence with a prepositional phrase. Well, if you don't end a sentence with a prepositional phrase, you've got a dangling participle verb as an answer, which means your sentence is incomplete. If you start the sentence without a prepositional phrase, your first two words, bridge is going to become a verb. In this case, it's an adjective. Because you've got, one is an adverb, modifies the adjective, bridge, which modifies the pronoun, is, which now is, uh, no, this one here is a one, two, one, two. No, this one here is one, two, one, two, one, two. I guess if you, if you had a third eyebrow, it'll probably be raised by now. He started talking, he started saying the correct syntax value to the sentence. The bridge is over the water. The bridge, he started saying it's an adverb, adjective, pronoun. The bridge is, which is correct. And then he switched it to adverb, verb, adverb, verb. And the reason why the first one is correct is because the is non-tangible adverb. Bridge is tangible contract. 
adjective is is tangible contract pronoun. And then over is non-tangible contract adverb. And we know nothing can follow a pronoun except for a break in the continuance of the evidence or an adverb. So that's a 1, 3, 4, 1, which is in compliance with correct sentence structure rules. The bridge is over. 1, 2, 1, 2 is would not be an adverb because this is tangible contract. How do I know that? Well, because if you parse the word is and go back to the earliest nativity root meaning of the word, it comes from a Proto-Indo-European root, which is tangible. And that's the baseline with which we credential all the words that we syntax, whether they're tangible or non-tangible, which creates a consistent banking of syntax values if you follow that procedure. Show me a verb bridge and a river bridge. I mean a river verb and a bridge verb. Now when the government writes their instructions on most of their forms, they don't use adjectives. They only use adverb, verb, adverb, verb, adverb, verb throughout the entire sentence structure. Because of this program, you have 68 prepositions and 38 articles. That's 1800 divided by 2 means every word in the English language has 900 definitions. Yeah. Pen. Pen by itself is a pronoun. If I say the pen, the is an adverb which modifies the verb pen. Modification is change, change is motion, motion is action, action is, pen, is verb. Okay, now if I say of pen, of is normally the preposition and those the article. Separated, they both become adverbs. So now you have an adverb of pen, or by pen, or with pen, or... They become adverbs depending upon where they're situated in a word group, depending upon the syntax. It's not cut and dry that they're going to be adverbs, uh, but in the scenario he's talking about, they are. Like the pen, the is an adverb. Over pen, under pen, doesn't matter how you do it. If you separate all the prepositions and all the articles, this is going to become a verb. Now, if you use a prepositional phrase, for this pen, for my pen, for your pen, for his pen, for her pen, with her pen, with his pen. See, every time I change the preposition or change the article, I change the ownership and I change the operation of the pen. If I change the operation of pen, and I can do it 900 times, so if I put two nouns together, now I've got 81,000 variables. If I put three words together in a sentence, now I've got uh, seven point 7.2 7 million variables. I put the third or fourth word in, I got 640 million variables. I put five words in a sentence, I got 5.4 billion variables. And it goes on and on. So the government comes back and says, we can't do that. We don't have a com computer that can break the code because the amount of terabytes of information just to write a single, a single document with 300 words, so you'd have 900 to the 300 power. I mean, that's a, there, there's no computer in the world that has enough terabyte capacity to do that. And that's why I don't think anyone's been able to create a computer program that can syntax uh, automatically or create sentence structure, uh, correct sentence structure automatically. There have been lots of people that have tried and I've had people come to me and say, I have a great idea. Let's create an app that can syntax sentences for people. Uh, they can just punch in the words and then the, the program will syntax it. We, we can't do that. Um, at least it hasn't been done yet up to this point simply because of the amount of effort it takes to credential whether a word is tangible or non-tangible or how you create a, the formulate the 567, 567, 2, 567, 567, 567. It's just, uh, like he just said, it's just way too much in order to do that. No computer has, as of yet, that we know of, uh, been able to handle that type of volume. So I think I'll draw it to a close there. You know, again, this is not meant to uh, disparage David in any way, shape, or form. Uh, this just has, we're just looking at the grammar here, looking at what he's saying. 
And like I said, you know, if you go and uh, study the grammar and get a rudim even just a rudimentary closure on it, and then you go back and watch these videos, you can see them for what they are. You know, he's a great teacher. He's very charismatic and all that. But some of the stuff that comes out of his mouth is, is contradictory. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, he's not here to answer any questions that we may have for him. But what we do have is hundreds of hours of material of him talking about this stuff and there's definitely some valuable nuggets in there and if he wouldn't have come out in 1988 with this stuff you know we wouldn't be able to do what we do with it today so we are all definitely have a, a debt of gratitude to that guy beyond a shadow of a doubt so thanks for watching uh, Happy holidays to everybody. If you want to learn the grammar, go ahead and contact me at the email address at the bottom of your screen. You can apply for a workshop. I'll set up a 10 to 15 minute video consult uh, where you can ask me whatever you want to ask me about it. And uh, other than that, there are two tiers of membership on this channel. You can see the join button under the video. Click the join button. It'll give you more information on that. And uh, yeah, thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one.